Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our, our worship service here. It's uh, good to be together, it's good to gather together, and it's good to be able to worship God, to sing his praises, and to read and hear his word. Just a, a couple of announcements for you tonight. Just a, a request that you would uh, be praying for Alistair and the family. He's um, over in Lewis at the moment, visiting his dad, who's very unwell. So please keep them in your prayers. Um, also a reminder that there will be no discipleship explored this week because of the holiday weekend. So no discipleship explored tomorrow. Um, it will be back on as usual next week, but it's, it's off for this week. And um, those are, are the announcements for, for this evening. Um, we'll begin our, our worship proper by singing to God's praise in Psalm 103. Psalm 103 in the Scottish Psalter version of the psalm, which you'll find on page 369. We're going to sing the first five verses. O thou my soul, bless God the Lord and all that in me is. Be stirred up his holy name to magnify and bless. Bless, O my soul, the Lord thy God, and not forgetful be of all his gracious benefits he hath bestowed on thee. This song reminds us that God is gracious, that we have much to be thankful for, and that he takes away our iniquities and our sins. So, we will, uh, if you can, stand please to sing to his praise. O oh, thou my soul, bless God the Lord. O oh, my soul, bless God the Lord. Let's bow our heads now and come before the Lord in prayer. Let's bring our prayer to him. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed a source of great blessing. We thank you that we, uh, we live and have our very being as a result of your goodness and your blessing to us. And we thank you that you have 
provided us with the um, the gift through which we can have our sins, our iniquities wiped away, that we can be made new, that we can be restored. And we pray that you would help us to uh, lay hold of that blessing and to rejoice in it and to live as those who have been freed, not as those who are still captives to our own sin. And we pray that you would give us thankful hearts, Lord, as we think on all that you have done for us. And Lord, it's true that the world is not always as we would want it to be. But we thank you that it is under your control and that nothing that the world can do can sever those that you have called from your love. So grant us resolve, Lord, to walk the path that you have laid out for us. And we pray for our our friends, our family, our colleagues, our neighbours, even those sitting among us tonight, Lord, who don't know you yet, who haven't haven't come into that saving relationship with you, who haven't professed your name, Lord. Lord, we pray that um, you would be working in their lives, that you would be scouring away whatever it is that stops them. And opening them to your truth, Lord. We know there are many who have never really never really had your word shared with them. They may be aware of the stories, but they've never really had Jesus brought to them. And we pray for them and we pray that you would help us to go out to them and take Jesus to them and, and speak to them of what he has done for us. But equally, Lord, we pray for those who have heard your truth, who have maybe heard it again and again throughout their lives and have turned their backs. And Lord God, we know that that can be hard for us to know how to deal with it, but help us not to give up, Lord, and to continue seeking their good and in prayer and in, in speech to them. And we pray, Lord, that you would break their hard hearts that you would turn them around to you. And help us, Lord, never to to second guess who you might be calling, never to make our own judgments about who's the right kind of people to take the gospel to. But help us, Lord, just to follow your calling, to get out there with your word and to share it and to get alongside people. And we pray that as we do that, you would bless with the spirit the word that we share so that many might gather around your word and to bless your name. We thank you for all our brothers and sisters throughout this area, throughout this nation, throughout the world who are committed to doing that. We thank you that we are not an isolated group meeting in solitude and going no further than these walls But we thank you that we are part of a much, much bigger family, a worldwide family whose head is Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those we know at the moment who are are struggling, who are unwell, whose bodies or whose minds are, are letting them down. And we pray, Lord, for your healing touch upon them, whatever situation they find themselves in, whether it's uh, mental distress, whether it's physical impairment, whether it's illness. We remember particularly Alistair and his dad. We pray for for that family and we pray that you would pour out your blessing onto them and watch over and keep them. We pray for those we know who are suffering still from the pandemic as it rolls through, whether those who have COVID or those who who find themselves more anxious because of it, for those whose health is more at risk, for those who have watched loved ones suffer and who have even lost loved ones. We pray that you would help us to remember that you are greater than any disease, 
more powerful than any circumstance and to trust in you. Thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you have given it to us. And more than that, that you bless us when we read it. That the Holy Spirit, we pray, would be alongside us, opening it to us as we study it. That we would be aware of his presence as he teaches us from it and encourages us from it. It's such a great gift, Lord. Help us never to take it for granted. But to feed from it daily so that we might grow. We might grow in the way that you have made us to. To work for you. Lord God, we pray that you would bless it tonight as we study it. That you would help us to put aside any distractions. That you would help us to clear our minds that we might focus on your word. And we pray that our time together this evening as we read, as we sing, as we pray, would be one of great blessing. Not just for us, but for those who we go on to encounter with this fresh in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pray for, for our governments, for our rulers, for those in power and authority. We remember the Queen as uh, it's been announced that, that she's tested positive for COVID as well and we pray that you would be with her in her frailty and her age with that on top of everything else. We just ask that you would strengthen and uplift her. We thank you for the witness that she has been over the years and for her, her own faith which she has often spoken of. And we pray that that would strengthen her at this time and that she would continue to be able to witness to those around her and influence them by pointing them towards you. Lord, we ask all of these things with your blessing, with your continued blessing as we, we carry on with our service tonight. In the name above all names, that of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you uh, turn with me, please? I've got two readings tonight. And uh, the first of those you'll find in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. And chapter 6, if you have one of the church Bibles, that's on page 690. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read the whole of this chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, until the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken 
And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump of the land. And then I want to just uh, read a short passage from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation in chapter 4. It's not often we look at Revelation on a Sunday and now you're getting two in one day. Revelation chapter 4. It's on page 1236 of the Pew Bibles. And I just want to read a few verses there. And this is John speaking as he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Before we um, look at these passages this evening, we're going to sing again from Psalm 67. In the Sing Psalms version, Psalm 67. It's on page 84 of the Blue Psalm books. And this is a song again which speaks of um, praising God, of recognizing His goodness and of the benefits and the blessings that will flow from that. God, be merciful and bless us. Shine upon us with your face, that the earth may know your actions, and all lands your saving grace. Please stand if you can, and let's sing this psalm together. God, be merciful and bless us. Shine upon us with your face, that the earth may know your actions, and all hands your saving grace. O God, may the peoples praise you, may all peoples
Before we look at these passages together, let's just um, come before God once more in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open up your word to us now, that you would speak to us through it, you would grant us wisdom and understanding, that we might hear what you're speaking to each of us and that we might be challenged, encouraged and fed through your holy word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you would uh, turn back with me please to our reading from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and I would like to um, look particularly just now at the opening five verses which I'll read again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I wonder what, what each of you thinks about when you hear the word power. When you hear something described as having power, what image comes into your head? Is it a position of authority and being able to control others? Perhaps if you've been watching the news recently, it's the, the force of a storm as it tears up trees and rips apart buildings and whips up tides. Is it the roar of an engine of a fancy performance vehicle, a high-end car or something? Or is it maybe Scotland's Hamish Watson hitting the defensive line full tilt and just not stopping? Well, when Catherine and I got married, we went to Canada for our honeymoon. And as part of our trip, we spent a couple of days in Niagara. And of course... You don't go to Niagara to sit in a hotel room. We did what tourists do. And we took one of the made of the mist boat trips out into the midst of the falls. Now that is some power to be standing in the presence of. I don't know if any of you have been there. I mean, on one level, it's only water. But there is some force behind it. There's enough power there to shape geography and as you're standing there in the boat with the water hammering down about you you can't help but feel a little bit awed to feel impressed but also to feel a little bit unnerved because being in the presence of power can be like that In today's readings, we saw Isaiah and John describing two very similar scenes. Two visions that they had where they they both found themselves in the presence of a power that dwarfs anything any of us have experienced. And I want to look at these passages and I want to think about what it teaches us about the God we serve and how we should respond to what we learn about him. I also want to look at what was different about John's experience in Revelation and, and why that matters to us. I've got three headings tonight to, to help us unpack this. And they are uncontained, undone, and unafraid. So uncontained, undone and unafraid. First off, I want to think about being uncontained. 
And if you'd look with me again at at what it says in verse 1 of our passage from Isaiah there. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. What, What is Isaiah telling us here? What does this detail mean? Why is it there? Well, if you were around when we were going through the series on the tabernacle, you might remember that there was a, there was a special part of the tabernacle. And it could also be found in the temple that followed based on the same design. And it was called the Most Holy Place. And what was special about the Most Holy Place was that that was where the glory of God dwelled among his people. So hold that in mind for a moment while we think about a nuclear reactor. Don't worry, you are not going to have to understand physics for this one. I don't. Just bear with me. Because what I want to talk about is probably the the simplest part of a nuclear reactor. But in many ways, the most important. And it's basically... a massive concrete shell, meters and meters thick. Sometimes it might include lead or steel in with the concrete. And it's called the containment chamber. It might sometimes be called a containment structure or a containment building. But the key word here is containment. And it does exactly what the name would suggest. It keeps all the massive forces, all the energy that's produced in a nuclear reaction where it's supposed to be, inside the reaction chamber. Now, for some reason, when they built the reactor building in Chernobyl, they did not build a containment building. And that is why, in April 1986, when the core went into meltdown... Things went very, very bad, very, very quickly. Okay, so all very interesting, I'm sure, but what does this have to do with the most holy place and the opening verses of Isaiah? Well, the thing is, if we start to think about the glory of God being in the most holy place, we can start to think almost as if it's only in the most holy place. It's easy to start thinking that it is contained in the most holy place. Because that is how we like to deal with things when they are too powerful for us. To keep them safe. Just like a nuclear reactor. Containment keeps things safe and it keeps us safe from them. And it's very easy when we think about God to let this idea creep in there as well. We like the idea of a God who is powerful. He's inspiring. He's also a little bit unnerving. So we also like the idea of a God who is powerful but contained controllable, safe. Unfortunately for us, or fortunately, that is not what we have. Because what Isaiah says there, when he talks about the train, he's basically saying, you think God is contained in the most holy place? Just the train of his robes, the trailing edge of his clothes, the hem of his garment fills the whole temple. Verses 2 and 3, if we look on, the very angels, that's what the seraphs are, they're angels, one of the highest ranks of angel. They hide their faces from the glory of God. And they cry out, Holy, Holy Holy. Now, 
It's easy to think, especially when we read it like that, when we read it with commas between each of the words, it's easy to think of that as a kind of a a lyrical flourish, especially if any of you are familiar with the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But there's a lot more to it than that. See, the most holy place that we were talking about, in Hebrew, that is literally the holy, holy place. Because that's how they make superlatives, extreme statements in Hebrew. They repeat an adjective. So the whole temple is holy. But this special room is holy, holy. Super holy. Well, the seraphs, the angels, they say, holy, holy, holy. The temple may be holy, and the inner room may be holy, holy. But God is holy, holy, holy. He takes holiness to a whole new level. You think God is contained within the most holy place? No. That's just like a viewing window where we can get a a glimpse of his glory in a way that we can handle. You can't fit holy, holy, holy in a holy, holy room. Look at verse 3 again. The whole earth is filled up with his glory. He cannot be contained. Not by the most holy place, not by the temple, not by the whole of creation. He is uncontained because he is uncontainable. So what is Isaiah's reaction to this realization? That brings us to our second point, undone. If we read what it says um, in verse 5, we see that Isaiah says, Woe to me, I am ruined. Some translations will say, I am am destroyed. Some will say, I am undone. What is he talking about? Well, I wonder how many of you have ever wondered what it would be like to stand on the surface of the sun. Probably not that many of you. Fortunately for this illustration, lots of people have, and many of them have done so on the internet, where they have come into contact with real scientists who know way more about this stuff than I do. Now, any of you who do know anything about the sun are maybe thinking at this point, this guy does not know what he is talking about. The sun does not have a surface. That is technically true, but irrelevant at this point. Because what would happen even before you got close to, say, the outer edge of the photosphere, this hypothetical surface of the sun, is that you would encounter temperatures so high and light so bright that the actual molecules which make up your body would not be able to exist anymore. You would be torn, not limb from limb, but atom from atom by the forces that you were dealing with. And as you got closer, even those individual atoms would be ripped apart into subatomic particles. You would be disintegrated you would be undone. Because that's what the word that's used here means. Undone, disintegrated, taken apart. Because Isaiah was standing in the presence of something far more powerful than the sun. Something which outshines the sun by an incalculable magnitude. And he understands that that means there is enough power here to disintegrate the entire universe. Never mind him, a sinner.
we have a tendency to think of glory as being kind of soft, sort of shimmery light, which kind of suffuses the whole place. Maybe a backdrop of angelic voices singing, something not too loud. Glory is impressive, but it's essentially harmless. It's nice. The Hebrew word for glory is actually derived from the word for heavy, weighty. Because glory is not insubstantial. It is not airy-fairy. It is heavy. It is impressive, yes, literally because it presses down on things. It makes an impression. Now in physics, the the more massive, the heavier an object is, the more it presses down on space and time around it, and in doing so it distorts them and bends them around itself. And that is basically how gravity works. The larger and the more massy an object is, the more gravity it has, the more force it exerts around it. Our hypothetical trip to the sun if somehow we could shield ourselves from the the sheer energies pouring off that burning ball of gas, we would encounter at the outer edge of its influence gravity roughly 28 times that which we are labouring under just now. And we would be crushed. And again, Isaiah is in the presence of something with much more presence, much more power. This glory has a real weight which is pressing down on him. Is it any wonder then that he cries out that he is undone? That is a right response to being in the presence of so much power. If Niagara Falls is unnerving, then the power that created the universe, seated on a throne, being sung of by the angels, it is in many ways a right response to fear and tremble. But there is more to it than that. Because we don't have to live like that. I want to think about the difference now for John when he saw essentially this same scene, when he saw this same throne room. If we read there, just the, the, look at the few verses there. In Revelation 4, just at verse 8, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. John's reaction is different. As he sees essentially the same scene. And this This brings us to our third point for this evening. Unafraid. Because although John is describing essentially the same scene and the same vision, God in his majesty, on his throne, angels singing, holy, 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 very similar. But anywhere else in the Bible where we read of people meeting with manifestations of God's power, angels, visions, even seeing Jesus showing just a hint of his power as he walked on the earth. The common reaction is fear. Isaiah doubts that he can even continue to exist. But we do not read about that here. We do not read about John being overcome by an awareness of his own sinfulness and crying out, I am undone. Why not? Was John 
not a sinner? Of course he was. Was he unaware of his own sin? Well, of course not. What did John have that Isaiah did not? Well, if you were here this morning when David preached on Revelation 1, you might realize that it's not a what at all. It's a who. It's Jesus. Because in that chapter that David looked at, we read how Jesus came to John and put his hand on him. That is what John had that Isaiah did not. John had Jesus. And because John had Jesus, John did not need to be afraid. Jesus, who was the source of life, who lived, who died, and who lived again, stood beside John. John had known him in the flesh when he walked in the world. He had heard his teaching. And he knew him now when he saw him again, risen in his glory. And because of that, John did not have to fear being undone in this presence, in this power. So what about you? Because one day, we will come into his presence. Now we might taste it slightly, seen through that viewing window. We might have hints of it. But one day we will come into his presence fully. And what will that mean for you? Because if we try and do it in our own strength, if we try and stand there in our own right, then we can't. We cannot stand in the presence of his glory you would be undone. And so instead, you will find yourself taken from his presence for eternity. But, if you are trusting in Jesus, if you are trusting in the one who died and yet lives, the one who has authority over life and death, then you can stand before God's glory and you can gaze on him, awed, worshipping, but unafraid. And that is not to say we should take God's glory lightly. He is majestic. And he is worthy of our worship. We should never forget that. But if we are trusting in Jesus, we will not be undone by his greatness. Can you say that today? Can you say today that you are unafraid? Or do you fear that you will be undone? Because if you can say that, then rejoice. And live your life as one who is unafraid. Let it show. And if not, will you be content to let that be your undoing? Isaiah knew God's promised one would come. But he didn't know his name. John did. And we do. We have the Gospels to tell us of Jesus. And to tell us of his invitation to us. To come to him. To be awed to be impressed, to worship, but unafraid. 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the promises that we have in your word that teach us both of your glory and of your compassion to us. That teach us that you are powerful enough that by rights we shouldn't even be able to look on you. But loving enough that you sent your son to die in our place so that we can be unafraid of your great majesty. Help us to live as those who have been set free. Help us to glory and rejoice in what has been done for us. And help us to share that news with those around us. So that they too might live unafraid. Lord God, we just ask that you would hear our prayer now. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to um, close by singing. In Psalm 99a, 99a in the uh, Sing Psalms. We're going to sing verses 1 to 5. This psalm sings about God on his throne, about his majesty and his might and our right response of worship. The Lord reigns from his throne on high. Let all the nations quake. He sits between the cherubim So let the whole earth shake. Great is the Lord on Zion Hill, exalted over all. Upon his great and holy name, let all the nations call. Verses 1 to 5, to God's praise, standing if you can. The Lord reigns from his throne on high. from this place with your blessing, with the grace, love, and peace of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, now and forevermore. Amen.